welcome to those who are listening on YouTube. This is Representative Bill Lippert. I chair the House Health Care Committee, and we are meeting today. Um, we're, today we are taking up uh, testimony regarding a, and I see Representative China is here. I'll admit him to the meeting. Uh, today we are, uh, we have witnesses to help us understand a proposal that is in the uh, governor's budget, uh, a proposal from the Department of Public Safety, but proposed in coordination, as we understand it, with the Department of Mental Health and the Department of Corrections. We have, uh, and this is a proposal that involves um, adding mental health staff or counselors uh, to law enforcement, uh, as has been done in some other parts of the state, uh, and, and there have been different models. But uh, our goal today is to hear from Commissioner uh, Mike Sherling from the Department of Public Safety, and then from Commissioner Sarah Squirrel from the Department of Mental Health. And uh, we will, uh, to, so we can understand the proposal as it's being put forward. Uh, we will then later, as I understand it, we'll be hearing from uh, Representative Christie, uh, who sits on the Judiciary Committee also is the chair, co-chair of the Social Equity Caucus, and there has been there have been a series of hearings and um, survey done, and I understand that between Representative Christie and uh, Robin Joy, uh, we will hear some results from the survey as it relates to issues of mental health and law enforcement as well. And I should say that we will be coming back to this topic uh, next. Tuesday, uh, and we will, so you'll need to stay tuned to our agenda, but we, we have added a, a meeting of this committee on Tuesday, 3.30 to 5, and then the committee will be meeting again on Wednesday and Thursday. But stay tuned for the times. I don't have them right at the top of my brain, but uh, it will be posted, and uh, several of those meetings at least will be to allow other stakeholders to comment on the proposal that will be put forward today. Uh, we're doing this uh, as the healthcare committee because we have jurisdiction over the areas of mental health. We understand that the Judiciary Committee uh, and the Government Operations Committee have both been involved in issues of police reform issues. The speaker has asked us to take the lead on uh, reviewing and making a proposal uh, based on our review and testimony uh, after we've had more time to take testimony. In the meantime, uh, some language has been put into the budget, is being put into the budget as a placeholder language that will allow our committee to continue its deliberations even as the budget moves forward in its process. So with that, uh, I'd like to welcome, and I'm looking around the screen, uh, there, welcome Commissioner Sherling. Uh, you are either on the waterfront or you've got some really nifty background, uh, but it looks it looks very inviting. But welcome to the House Healthcare Committee. Thanks for having me. That's uh, that is not a Vermont background. It's quite a large boardwalk <laughs> back there. Oh yeah, I don't see the Adirondacks. <laughs> a minor minor missing piece. <laughs> okay. Um, thanks for having me and taking up this uh, important uh, discussion. Um, I know the committee has a, a memorandum that we drafted back in uh, July yes. that relates to this, but I figured I'd go back in, in history very briefly, um, uh, much further back than that, and then also bring you up to speed on some of the discussions from earlier pre-COVID uh, uh, time uh, during this legislative session. So, And if I can uh, interrupt you just for a second, I understand you have a hard stop at one o'clock, so... I just want other people to know that. Uh, I think we should be able to cover your testimony and hopefully hear from Sarah, Commissioner Squirrel as well during that period, perhaps some of the others. Uh, we wanna save time at the end for committee discussion, but we recognize that you have a hard stop at one. So. I'm gonna be relatively brief um, and I, there's within an hour, there's not enough time to go into all the nuances of, of uh, the efficacy of, the, of this initiative, but. Um, we'll cover the, the key pieces and leave plenty of time uh, for interactive committee discussion. Um, the general history here is that the use of uh, embedded mental health and social work assets uh, within first response, within public safety, and in particular in law enforcement, has a, a long history both nationally and in Vermont. The first of its kind was an embedded social worker in the town of Bellows Falls. 
Uh, and that has expanded over the course of the last two decades to uh, two very robust teams that work in Chittenden County, one in Burlington with assets both on the Church Street Marketplace and citywide, and a second team that works throughout um, the majority of the towns uh, in Chittenden County. That's done as a partnership between municipalities, uh, the state, the, uh, the local uh, police departments, the designated agency, the Howard Center, um, UV University of Vermont Medical Center, and, and a host of others. And it has grown over time from a, a single position uh, that was Matt Young, the original street outreach interventionist that was on uh, Church Street into uh, two teams, as I described. In addition, uh, within the Department of Public Safety, we have relationships with two designated agencies in the Westminster Barracks and the St. Albans Barracks, where uh, similar mental health outreach uh, embedded workers have been working for several years. Uh, that program is approximately five years old in St. Albans. And all of these programs have met with significant success. And by in defining success, um, when I was in Burlington, we did a, a number of different studies and assessments of call volume and interventions. And I'll just walk you through a couple of the sort of highlights. Um, the, the overarching goals have historically been uh, to improve outcomes from, for folks that are suffering um, with either mental illness or uh, a personality disorder or some other co-occurring disorder. It could be substance related. Uh, there could be some criminogenic uh, issues as well. Um, there could just be stress uh, in their life and um, trying to bring resources to bear as early in the process uh, for them as possible uh, results in better outcomes and ultimately works to reduce the number of times they interact with first responders, whether that's law enforcement or the number of times that they require um, an, an ambulance response uh, or a fire response for that matter, the number of times that they find themselves uh, in an emergency department uh, whether that's requiring a point in time uh, care or longer term hospitalization for some reason or another, to essentially intervene as quickly as possible to prevent things from deteriorating using a standard medical um, model. Um, all of these programs uh, have achieved a, a very interesting balance of uh, privacy, which is always a, a concern with these kinds of relationships, and um, and partnership. And by that, I mean um, weaving together uh, the folks that are, are responding to 911 calls on a day to day basis and adding this asset uh, to the array of tools that are available really has worked well while simultaneously not eroding uh, the medical privacy of people that are getting these services. And what I mean by that is it's essentially a one way street uh, of uh, flow of information from law enforcement. We're able to share with the, the uh, responders and the, the mental health and social workers um, a, a general overview of the of the types of, of things that we're encountering people, uh, the types of events we're encountering people in. But there's no need for law enforcement uh, and first responders to see anything to do with their uh, medical diagnosis, their history, uh, case notes, and things like that. That's all done in a designated agency using uh, the medical and HIPAA overlays that go with that. So that's the sort of high level overview of the way these uh, things have uh, evolved in Vermont. In January of this year, we put forth a multifaceted modernization strategy. And one of the uh, important uh, components of that was a desire to expand from the two barracks that we have now to all 10 barracks that uh, the state police uh, run. And not just to have these responders um, cover the service area that is exclusive to where the state police covered, but to cover the entire service area. So if a municipal department or a sheriff's department covers a particular portion of that barrack service area, these responders would be available throughout that service area, not specific just to uh, where the state police provide service. Um, historically, one of the impediments to expanding this program were efforts to um, try to get co-investment, uh, which does exist in, in other programs around the state, uh, right out of the gate before you get these workers out uh, in place. So for example, uh, looking to hospitals or municipalities to contribute as much as half the cost uh, to get these, these folks into service. What we opted to do in January was to sort of reverse those streams and to say, listen, we'll partner with the Department of Corrections and the Department of Mental Health and we'll put 
we'll fund the initial uh, positions and get them out in the field, uh, demonstrate the efficacy to uh, all of the towns, uh, municipalities, sheriff's departments, uh, and, and stakeholders. And then we will look to expand the programs by looking at that co-investment model. That still remains the plan, uh, but in uh, late February, early March of this year, we were struck with a global pandemic and uh, some of those plans were altered. Um, so the original plan to have uh, funding from three different state departments uh, provide as many as uh, six of these responders um, were altered to uh, initially in July uh, to have a plan where we were going to add two of these responders each year uh, for three years and then in the out years potentially add additional ones. Um, but we were successful in our um, budget construction in the, the Department of Public Safety to be able to actually add seven positions to our budget uh, for fiscal 21 and expand from nine of these uh, response, excuse me, from two of these responders to nine responders. So that would leave one barracks uh, uncovered in the near term uh, and would allow us to, uh, to move forward um, with a really a programmatic initiative rather than individual responders in two barracks that we have now. So what the future goal is, is to hire uh, each of these responders. They would remain uh, contractors with uh, and employees of the designated agencies. And uh, they would create a, essentially a team um, rather than individual responders. They would be a team that works within their service area, but uh, taking advantage of training, of the experience, uh, and the support from the various responders in the, the nine barracks that would have these, uh, these mental health clinicians. And in addition to that, the, the hope is that we would work to have uh, these folks closely embedded and working with the other social workers and mental health outreach specialists that exist throughout the state. Um, so that's the, that's the primary overview. Um, there's a lot more nuance to it uh, and a lot of different roads we could take in terms of exploring how it would work with memorandums of understanding and job descriptions and things like that. But I'll, I'll stop there and, and uh, let the chair and the committee sort of lead which road you'd like to go down. Okay, uh, thank you. I think, I think what I'm gonna suggest is that we because I, I certainly have some questions that, and some of them would be clarifying, but I think it might be helpful because what you're describing is a partnership with the DAs who we will hopefully will be hearing from next Tuesday. And they have also shared, uh, Julie Tesler has shared with us a memo, which I asked, had asked to be distributed again to members and posted on our committee page, because I thought it'd be useful to have that as background information as we heard here, listened here today as well. Uh, but we have, the Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health, which of course uh, contracts with the DAs for crisis services. And uh, let's, let's hear from Commissioner Squirrel. And uh, I see Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox is with us as well, welcome. Uh, but let's turn to Commissioner Squirrel and then let's open it up for questions. Uh, and I, I think there are some things which were helpful, but they may get clarified as we hear from Commissioner Squirrel as well. So with that, uh, Commissioner Squirrel, welcome. Uh, thank you, Representative Lippert. Uh, for the record, Sarah Squirrel, Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox is joining me here today. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify on this. Um, I also wanna just take a moment and uh, commend uh, Commissioner Sherling for his leadership on this, uh, for his vision of modernization of public safety. I think this is a real opportunity to strengthen our collaborative work between the Department of Mental Health, the Department of Public Safety and Corrections. Uh, we certainly are all well aware that a very high number of law enforcement calls are related to mental health and or substance use. Um, and this is a real opportunity to move in the right direction. Across Vermont, as Commissioner Sherling has highlighted, there is a continuum of collaboration that exists um, to respond to the high volume of law enforcement calls that are related to mental health and or substance use disorder concerns. Um, we have models that include the embedded social worker program that he um, referenced working with um, Northwest Counseling and Support Services um, in St. Albans, as well as HCRS uh, down in Southern Vermont. And, you know, I, I think the, the outcomes that we've seen as a result 
of that model of embedded clinicians is, you know, first and foremost, that individuals um, who are experiencing mental health challenges, a crisis in the community, um, can actually be referred quickly um, to appropriate services and supports. Um, it reduces the need for any kind of law enforcement intervention uh, for, you know, any path that leads to arrest or incarceration, um, greater access to treatment, um, likely decreases in the use of hospital EDs, um, an approach, of course, related to um, suicide prevention. And I think also fundamentally, you know, builds more trust and collaboration in the communities, um, which is something that is a strength of Vermont and that we continue to build on. Um, we also have um, community outreach and street outreach programs um, that function a little bit differently than the embedded clinician model um, that the Department of Mental Health has been instrumental in leading as well. Uh, folks are aware that we have a community outreach program at the Howard Center um, that covers kind of six communities in the Chittenden County area um, and has that kind of innovative rated funding model um, where DMH provides some funding, the municipalities provide some funding, um, as well as um, uh, the local uh, hospital network. Um, and then DMH also provides funding um, to the Howard Center for their street outreach program. Um, I think when I think about this, you know, I really think a lot about um, implementation and the delivery model. Um, and I think one of the things that, you know, is really exciting to me and why I'm, you know, so pleased with Commissioner Sherling's leadership on this um, is that we kind of have a little bit of a patchwork quilt of approaches in Vermont. And what we really need to do is to knit those approaches together and bring something to scale across the state that will actually have meaningful impact um, to support Vermonters. Um, and like all things in Vermont, we need to have something that is um, consistent, that we can implement systemically, um, but still allows for the regional nuances and um, you know, the uniqueness of communities um, to inform that work. Um, I also know that, that trusting relationships and collaboration are at the heart of any successful implementation. Um, and the fact that both DMH, Department of Public Safety and DOC, you know, will have an MOU um, that really links and articulates the collaborative partnerships between us, um, ensures kind of ongoing quality improvement. Um, and further that, you know, the heart of this model and work and implementation will be held by our community mental health agencies. Um, so certainly the designated agencies as the hub for this work, um, you know, ensures that it will continue to have, you know, the kind of clinical oversight that we would want to see. Um, the other piece that I would add that I think is important for us to consider um, and have discussed with Commissioner Sherling um, is to, the need to ensure that stakeholder voice and peers and individuals with lived experience um, are informing our work. Um, we certainly want to take the time to ensure that those who are directly impacted have a voice as we move this work forward. Um, I think we should, you know, take some time in the next few weeks to ensure that we um, bring those voices in um, to understand what um, they are thinking about how we might move this forward. Um, I certainly um, speak for the Department of Mental Health. We think this is the right direction to go, um, but want to ensure that we have really heard um, peer voices and individuals um, with lived experience. I also think the model itself is currently contemplated, you know, does really, you know, lay a framework for ongoing, you know, accountability um, in that area as well. Um, the designated agencies, um, I think, are well prepared to continue to ensure that through their respective tables, um, that the voice of individuals with lived experience will continue to inform the work, um, to improve it as we go forward. Um, and also we have our adult state standing committee at the Department of Mental Health um, that we want to ensure um, has voice and input. And the designated agencies themselves will also have the opportunity to bring in that input through their respective standing committees as well. Um, so I think in the, in the short term, um, supporting and moving forward with embedded clinicians um, is the right direction to go. I also think there's some midterm and longer term pieces that we want to continue to think about as a system of care, which is also broadly expanding and strengthening emergency services in general, um, so that we can have a more proactive response initially um, that might not even need law enforcement at all. Um, but that might be more midterm to long term. Um, as well as continuing um, to strengthen um, 
you know, our ability to bring peers into that work um, and to have peers um, supporting that work at the community level. Um, again, I think that there, those are more midterm and long-term strategies that are also aligned um, with the MH's 10-year plan. So um, those are just, uh, I guess, some initial comments um, from the Department of Mental Health. Uh, we really support uh, this collaboration with the Department of Public Safety um, and are looking forward to getting this work off the ground. I will pause for a moment uh, just because Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox has done a lot of work on this um, and just, you know, Deputy Commissioner Fox wanted to see if there's anything else that you wanted to add um, based on your experience with street outreach and community outreach. You're, you're, you're muted, uh, Fox. There. Just very briefly, thank you. Uh, Morning Fox for the record, Deputy Commissioner, uh, Department of Mental Health. Uh, as uh, Commissioner Squirrel mentioned, uh, a lot of the work I've done over the 25 years in my professional career uh, have uh, been at that intersection of law enforcement and mental health. Uh, I've been involved with uh, folks who have developed uh, the crisis intervention training model out of Tennessee, uh, was uh, one of the uh, founding, uh, helped develop and still a part of the, the uh, steering committee for Team 2 Vermont. Uh, and uh, continue here as well as throughout New England doing trainings with law enforcement uh, around verbal de-escalation and uh, violence prevention skill training. Uh, I have been able to see a lot of the work that uh, uh, has happened with the uh, Bellows Falls embedded uh, worker as well as uh, uh, through the St. Albans barracks um, and having uh, mental health professionals uh, teaming up with law enforcement uh, is a, uh, a growing uh, uh, model uh, throughout uh, the country and, and the world. Uh, and uh, uh, it's time and time again shown uh, success in being able to divert uh, people from uh, law enforcement or the criminal justice system. And so I'm very excited about uh, expanding what we have uh, and needing to keep uh, in mind that all areas of Vermont are not the same. And so uh, I think having embedded workers within uh, the state police barracks is, is a great step in, in kind of unifying a lot of what we have around, but we also, as Commissioner Squirrel mentioned, have uh, street outreach and community outreach programs, which are also showing to be very effective and, and useful programs. Uh, and so I think, you know, as we move forward, uh, again, as Commissioner Squirrel mentioned, continuing to further develop and support and provide resources for the uh, crisis services and, and community-based services um, will help uh, to, to even get to a place where we can avoid uh, that there has to be that intersection of law enforcement and mental health. Um, I think that's, that's the, the ultimate goal. But again, you know, uh, we're talking probably mid and longer term range, but I think Right now, this is a, a great next step in, in, in moving that way. And I think it puts Vermont uh, in a position of being a, a national leader uh, in doing this type of work. Uh, so I will stop there, but uh, thank you for the time. Thank you, uh, Deputy Commissioner Fox. I, I might ask, if I may, to you, you, you referred to Team 2, and for the be benefit of all of us on the committee, uh, perhaps you could say something more. I believe I know what team two refers to, but I'm not sure if all of us will remember fully. So if you could say something more about that, I think that's particularly pertinent to what we're talking about here today. Sure, team two uh, is a model uh, that basically pairs law enforcement and, and uh, mental health professionals, crisis workers. Um, it's a, uh, a, a training model that helps both sides of the table, if you will, the law enforcement end and the mental health uh, service provider and to better understand the uh, capacities and limitations uh, and laws that they have to operate under on the other sides uh, to better help coordinate uh, these types of efforts. Uh, it really fits in very well and I think has laid kind of the groundwork for making embedded workers uh, within law enforcement be a much smoother transition than if we were to just start that without having a team two model. Uh, you know, the trainings are scenario based uh, and 
uh, we have emergency service clinicians working with law enforcement that are in their general communities. And so you're working with people and training with people that you will actually be working with out in the field. Uh, and some, some of the major problems that, that do and have come up uh, when you have both mental health and law enforcement uh, responding to the, the same crisis, if you will, is their communication with each other. And you know the, the classic who's on first type of thing, who takes a lead, um, you know, uh, answering those types of questions beforehand, understanding the laws, you know, for the mental health professionals to understand the laws, limitations, and capacities of law enforcement uh, helps them to better understand what, what their role is. And similarly, on the law enforcement side, to have a better understanding of the laws, limitations, and capacity of the mental health service uh, providers so that you're not having to work out those understandings in the midst of a crisis. Uh, and, uh, and so that, that's the kind of the overall arching tenant of, of the training. We do train the trainer models so that people, both law enforcement and the mental health professionals, bring this information back to their respective uh, agencies as well. Uh, and we continue to do those trainings. Uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me right now, but we're talking of uh, a very high percentage of uh, law enforcement uh, departments throughout uh, the state, not just state police and sheriffs, but also just mun municipal police departments. Uh, a large percentage have, have had uh, members go through this training. We've expanded the training to include state's attorneys. Um, uh, we've had judges attend, uh, members from uh, hospitals and emergency rooms, uh, uh, EMS personnel uh, as well, uh, as well as dispatchers. And so really trying to have a better understanding of, of each person's role uh, during a crisis, I think is very, uh, 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 it's a very important aspect so that again, you're not trying to figure out the, those roles in the midst of a crisis, because uh, that only contributes to negative outcomes uh, when you're trying to build that plane as you're flying it, if you will. Right, okay, thank you. I think that that's, that's helpful background information as well. You're welcome. Uh, I see that we have a number of committee members uh, who have raised their virtual blue hand uh, and have questions. Um, I, I'd like to ask an initial question uh, as, as a clarifying, for me, it's a clarifying question and Commissioner Sherling, if, I don't know if you're able, you know, yep, you're still with us, you're just not on video. Uh, there you go. Um, the term embedded is being used and I think it's, it would be helpful for me and helpful for us to understand what it is that is meant by an embedded, I don't know if clinician is the term that you use, but an embedded, embedded social worker or embedded mental health worker. Can you help us understand what that means and, um, and why that term is used or why it's important? Certainly. Um, it goes to that close collaboration uh, and communication that uh, Deputy Commissioner Fox was talking about, that um, it's really about having these folks fully embedded with the, uh, with the law enforcement agency, with the community, so that they have a full understanding uh, of and a full view of the, the field of play. Um, in many instances, uh, if uh, if there are roll calls where the beginning of a shift happens, there's multiple officers coming on, they're getting a briefing. These uh, mental health workers are going to that briefing. Uh, they have full access to the law enforcement facilities to be able to uh, interact with folks and gather information and figure out where their resources are best utilized. Um, it's essentially a, a, a descriptor of um, the operating environment where the barriers to sharing uh, information and allowing access so they can do their work are broken down. And does that speak to issues of co-location? It can. Uh, in, or, it, or is that not necessarily always the case? It, it's not always the case in Vermont. Um, as Commissioner Squirrel mentioned, uh, trying to move to a model where we're you know, uniformly using best practice around the state is one of the overarching goals. Uh, and co-location is, an, I think, an important piece of that, not necessarily uh, on a full-time basis, because oftentimes this work is happening in the field, uh, but having the ability to co-locate uh, really 
is an essential piece of building relationships and sharing information and ensuring that uh, that the work is done uh, at the highest possible level and with the greatest breadth of information informing it. Okay, right. thank you. So uh, I saw Representative Houghton had her hand up and then I think Representative Mari, uh, Mari Cordes and Representative China. And um, just Maybe. to continue that line of questioning a little bit. So when you say embedded, um, for state police, but then in Chittenden County, we have the community outreach team. What is, is there, and if there is, what is it, the a difference between those two models? There's not a substantive di difference in, in part because our model's not fully fleshed out yet, but I know those teams do have direct access to their law enforcement agencies. They go to roll calls, they do ride alongs. In many instances, they actually carry radios uh, and that's, I think, something we would envision as well uh, and have access to our computer-aided dispatch and records management system. That way they can see a call coming in or hear a call coming in. They can say, oh, I know John Smith. I've been working with him. Uh, I'm well suited to respond to that. I can take that call instead of sending an officer. Uh, or they may choose to go with an officer. Or they may say, hey, uh, you know, John's been a little violent recently. Uh, once you get there and get things settled, let me know and I'll come over and I'll work with him. So just provides a lot of different opportunities for um, to enhance response based on uh, being, I mean, embedded is one way to describe it, but really just being part of the team is, I, okay. I guess, the best way to paraphrase it. Thank you. And then just one follow-up question on the team two, is that, um, are all officers who have either an embedded or community outreach or street outreach connected with them required to go through that training? Uh, team two is not a, a requirement um, uh, at this point, uh, but I believe that most of the folks who have uh, part of the uh, like community outreach program and uh, things of that sort have gone through uh, the team two training. Um, but team two is, is strictly a voluntary uh, training at this time. Uh, and has been since its inception uh, several years ago. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Representative Cordes, and then Representative China, Representative Christensen, and Representative Page of questions. Thank you. Um, I have a concern that I haven't seen a reference both in the uh, memo um, or in the larger plan or the presentation to uh, formalization of a relationship with the Racial Equity Task Force, um, and especially in light of the recent Cornell UVM report that showed that um, implicit bias training um, had little to no impact on policing behavior. Um, in this, this I know we're talking about um, mental health, but I, I strongly believe that um, a formal relationship um, with the Racial Equity Task Force um, and or the Human Rights Commission um, should be involved in any work around, um, any work, period, uh, but especially around public safety. Can you, um, all the commissioners and deputy commissioners, if you can respond to that, I'd appreciate it. Sure, I'll start. Um, excuse me, the executive director of, of racial equity is involved uh, with us on a daily basis on uh, much of our policy making and and our initiatives. So that's one piece of the puzzle. The other is um, within the Department of Public Safety, I, I would dare say we have the most robust uh, equity um, advisory structure probably in all of state government um, that's grown up over the last several years. We have a fair and impartial policing committee uh, that now has co-directors, uh, both uh, a sworn um, captain, but also now a civilian um, co-director and a huge team of stakeholders, uh, most of which are outside of state government, uh, many of the names that you would recognize that help us guide these kinds of strategies. And uh, they're very much in the loop on, on this initiative. Thank you. So they've been directly involved? Correct. They vet things like our modernization strategy, our 10 point fair and impartial policing plan that we put forth in June in the wake of the George Floyd tragedy. Um, we're in constant contact. I wonder if it would be instructive to have them listed in the outward facing, the public facing materials that you present 
as, as a model of, of how to create state policy and include those representatives. I think uh, Commissioner Sherling, we're, we're, we're happy to explore time. that. I'm sorry, I was speaking over Commissioner Sherling. I'm not sure if people heard what I didn't hear what you said, unfortunately. Which piece? Well, um, the, the response I think Representative Cordes question. was asking about uh, having making reference to them, uh, and then you had a response. Yes, I just said we'll uh, we'll take a look at uh, ways to do that. I see. Okay. Thank you. Any yeah. comments from Re Commissioner or Deputy Commissioner from DMH? Uh, no, the only uh, comment with that I would make would be that I would support that perhaps more formalized connection and certainly articulating it in the memo and the program design, I think is important um, because I think this is an effort to improve healthcare access, um, but we wanna make sure that we're tailoring the provision of care or services or the enhancement of care um, to remove any obstacles um, that minority patients or individuals might face. Um, so, and to continue to promote culturally informed services. So I do think that's an important next step and I appreciate the representative bringing that up. Any further comments? I can only echo uh, what both commissioners said and uh, just said, it's a, I think it's an important piece to make sure that it is uh, part part of the the process uh, people with mental health issues are historically stigmatized and biased against uh, as well as uh, uh, people of color as well uh, and so uh, combining those together makes for an even more potential uh, from a from a, a bias or stigma perspective and so it can only uh, add to the to the potential success of this by by including that okay thank you um, Represent, Representative Cordes, was that, that was, okay, we're gonna continue on then with Representative Chena. Thanks. And yes, thank you. By, I don't know if Representative Houghton, you had your hand up again, or I, Representative Christensen following Representative Chena. Thank you. Um, I think my questions start with, um, with um, I, I don't know, are you Secretary Sherling? I, you, I don't know what your title is. Are you the yes. Secretary? Mike is fine. Okay, well, Mike, it start, I think it starts with you, although I think where it goes is to all of the witnesses, but um, from my recollection, like when Burlington was first, um, had, first had a, the street outreach program, it was just Matt Young and then it expanded. At some point along the way, there was street outreach worker embedded at the police department. And I don't believe that's the case now, but I could be wrong. So I think um, my first question is, is there still a worker embedded in the Burlington Police Department or did that stop at some point? I'm not aware that that stopped. When I was the chief of police in Burlington, we expanded from a team of two to a team of six uh, in the city. And we expanded that from just being on the marketplace to being uh, a statewide response entity. And they all had uh, radios. Uh, they came to our roll calls, they were fully uh, embedded in the day-to-day -day, uh, emergency and non-emergency response citywide. I don't know if that's changed because I haven't been there in about five plus years. Yeah, and I'm not sure either. So, because I was going to ask if, you know, if it has changed, why would they not, why are they not embedded there anymore? And the reason being, we're talking about adding embedded workers to state barracks, but, you know, if they're not embedded in Burlington, I'd, I'd be curious, what were the reasons why that stopped? Um, so I can... Go ahead. If you have an answer, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I just have a little bit of information yes. that might help clarify Representative Chena. So just to clarify, we have two programs that are focused on Chittenden County that the Department of Mental Health provides funding for. Uh, the first is the Community Outreach Program, um, which I would say is the newer program, if you will, um, where that covers um, uh, a broader community. I think it's um, South Burlington, Richmond just came on board. Um, and that's kind of a that braided funding model where DMH provides, I think it's $160,000 um, to that effort. Um, there's a UVM grant that also funds it um, and some additional funding as well. And that's 
community outreach that's focused on, I think it's five or six different um, municipalities. Originally, there is the street outreach program, which DMH also funds. Um, we provide global commitment investment dollars to the Howard Center, along with some of our mental health block grant funds. And that currently funds four full-time specialists who are embedded and work closely with the Burlington Police Department. Um, it is focused, it is my understanding that that is focused a little bit more on uh, the Church Street area and just that downtown Burlington area. So it doesn't have the same breadth that the community outreach does. Uh, but there are currently um, four full-time folks um, that are a part of that street outreach working very closely with the Burlington Police Department. And I'm looking look at Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox to see if I got any of that wrong. <laughs> so there are still workers embedded in the Burlington Police Department. Yeah, the, the yeah. word I use is works closely with. Um, so what that looks like in terms of embedded, um, I would just need to, I think I would need some more clarification. The, well, I, I know that the, um, there were, that they, there was at least one worker uh, and I Googled uh, just now to, to fact check myself to make sure I was correct, who had an office at the station. And um, in the article, it talks about how people used to call him a narc because he, uh, they viewed him as working for the police and that he had to do a lot of work to try to like, that his tires were slashed, et cetera. And so I guess I just bring it up because I'm trying to understand like, um, what were some of the challenges that we saw of having embedded police officers in Burlington and Embed how Embedded that, mental health workers? Uh, my bad, embedded mental health. See, that's the Freudian slip. I, And that's the mistake I think other people make when you embed mental health workers with the police, but um, is that they start to view them as an extension of the police. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, I'm trying to better understand some of the lessons learned in Burlington. I know every part of the state is different, but that doesn't mean that there aren't lessons to be learned. Um, and I do think it'd be good to hear more from people on what their experiences were, what the challenges were, as well as the strengths of having. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I spent literally hundreds of hours uh, walking the street with Matt Young and his team and growing this program uh, in Burlington. and. I can tell you unequivocally the concerns um, like the, uh, that was Justin, um, that was re relating that experience where someone called him an arc, um, are those kinds of concerns and confusions are few. Uh, more often than not, what we actually see is people in the community, once they uh, realize that those workers exist, they're calling and asking for them to come and help them. Um, so that is the most prevalent experience is that we get people who are um, in, ha have some frequency of need of services of some kind and don't have to have those services uh, or needs met. And uh, more often than not, they're actually calling and saying, can you send me Bob or Joe or Samantha or whoever that worker is? Because I really want to talk to them. I really need to talk to them. And, and it actually creates a little bit of a challenge in that they're not uh, that person's specific clinician. But what the role of it has evolved to in some instances is being that sort of pivot point that the mental health worker being the pivot point to connect them back to their designated clinician or to other services and and really being that that global facilitator for them uh, to ensure that they stay uh, healthy and, and safe. I appreciate it. I have one other question that um, it sort of pushes the connection between this specific suggestion and the greater system of care. And when, when I stumbled upon, when I was reading the article, I stumbled, stumbled, stumbled upon a quote from you, Mike, from 2014, so you may not remember it, but I want to read it and, and see what your thoughts and the other's thoughts are about this quote, because when the, you said to the seven days that um, it's not a magical answer to the underlying challenges. The problem pre-November and post-November is the same, said Sherling. There are too many people reaching a crisis threshold on the street. And once that threshold is reached, there are very few options. We've got to create a system that minimizes the number of times that the behavior gets to that point that it requires that level of intervention. And I don't see any evidence of that going on anywhere. So, I mean, I know it's been six years since then. And I'm curious, like when we think about how this fits into the overall system of care, what your thoughts or the other um, mental health staff thoughts are about like, you know, that this is maybe not a magical answer and what are some of the other things we need to be thinking about connected to this to make it successful? That's an outstanding question and uh, I do very much remember that quote because I've said that and other versions of it many times over the last 15 years. Um, 
the underlying thesis, and I should actually start before I go into this thesis to say that uh, Commissioner Squirrel and Deputy Commissioner Fox and their team have done a lot over the last several years to um, to do the work that I was uh, essentially begging for at that time. But the underlying thesis is this, that uh, 50 years ago, deinstitutionalization was absolutely the right thing to do. But there was an unfulfilled promise of an investment of resources to care for people in communities that was only partially met. We disinvested when that happened, and we never reinvested in the requisite systems to support people in the field, um, whether that's underfunding, um, and this is not the fault of the current General Assembly, this is 50 years of underfunding uh, the Department of Mental Health designated agencies uh, and the healthcare system in general. And as a result, what we see is we've reinstitutionalized many of, of uh, many folks that would have traditionally been in the mental health system in the criminal justice system. And the, the, the more nuanced piece of the thesis is that we wait for folks to decompensate, to get to a crisis level before we offer them any level of intervention. And this program is designed to change that as is uh, a suite of, of options that we put forth, uh, actually a model for uh, criminal justice and public health that we put forth in our modernization strategy in January, which has four sections to it. And it, the, the underlying premise there is that a dollar spent earlier on in the system is a better dollar spent. So the first stage is education and prevention. Prevent illness, prevent crime, prevent whatever it is, uh, from prevent drug addiction from happening, and that's your best dollar. The next level is outreach and intervention, and that's where this program comes in. If we can intervene early, we can identify challenges, whether that's in schools, uh, in our healthcare system, in criminal justice, with police officers as problem solvers, with embedded mental health workers, whatever the approach is, if we can intervene early, fix something before it becomes a bigger problem, then that's a better dollar spent. And next is alternative sanctions. So now you're in a place where, um, whether it's low level crime or disorder, or it's um, uh, decompensation uh, by a, a patient that suffers from mental illness, and now they need um, more enhanced services. The other areas have failed. And uh, on the mental health side, maybe it's uh, a day uh, at a crisis facility in a crisis bed, or on the criminogenic side, um, it's low level disorderly conduct or something where someone ends up um, in detention for a day and then they go through a diversion process. Um, those, bringing those low level interventions to bear and the best examples of those are things like restorative justice, traditional diversion, things that aren't using the blunt instrument of the back end of the criminal justice system to try to correct behavior but being far more nuanced and um, really using more of a health and, and compassion and safety approach. And then finally, you reserve the resources of the traditional courts and corrections only for those folks uh, who really have significant intractable problems that haven't been able to be solved through education and prevention, outreach and intervention, and alternative uh, methodologies. So I appreciate the opportunity to walk you through that model. That's a vast oversimplification of the model and the underlying thesis of what's causing some of uh, the challenges that we face on the street in the 21st century. Um, but uh, I think those challenges still exist. As I travel around Vermont and I talk with municipalities, with first responders, whether that's uh, police officers, folks that are in the back of an ambulance or uh, firefighters who are doing first response, um, they remain very concerned about the intersection of mental health and uh, people's uh, well-being in that regard uh, and the demand on services and our ability, ultimately our ability to care for those folks and what we have for resources. And again, um, under Commissioner Squirrel, uh, there's been a lot of emphasis on this and a lot of progress been, has been made, but we still have, uh, as demonstrated by this proposal, we have more to do. You're, you're muted, Brian. I'm sorry, thank, I was just gonna say thank you. And I, I really appreciate you talking about it more and I don't, want to take up too much more time because I know we have other witnesses. Um, and I just wanted to say that um, I appreciated um, that you, you, you know, your, your understanding and you're making the case for how we spend money as a society is going to affect the outcomes. And it sounds like, you know, you're, you're making the case for us to invest a lot more money in healthcare and in mental health than in like the extreme sort of police interventions, because by investing money in the system of care, we're actually going to reduce the need for those interventions. 
and it's sort of like it's uh, uh, maybe a better investment of our money in the long term um, in fulfilling that promise. So. You're absolutely right. There, it is absolutely a better investment. The big challenge, and as the General Assembly, it's the one that's that is laid at your feet because you have to make the financial decisions. Is you can't pivot the system on a dime. So we have the structures we have now, and we're trying to to modify and improve them and modernize them. Um, and we're trying to get as many people uh, diverted away from traditional corrections and courts as possible, or hospitalization on the on the other on the, in a different lane. Um, but we've got to be able to maintain those systems until we're able to make the pivot. So that's the that's the really hard part is where do you find the resources to make that, that pivot? And again, this um, this policy choice and this proposal to spend this money is an example of how to make that pivot. I think. Yeah, it's, it's sort of on the micro level, trying to do what we need to do on the for the whole system. So yes, and I, I should uh, also say, I, uh, Commissioner Squirrel and Deputy Commissioner Fox are the subject matter experts here. So um, I would also defer to them to tell me whether I've I've got any any of this wrong. So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, intervene here as the chair just to say that I understand that Commissioner Sherling, you're going to need to leave us shortly, and I have a number of the committee members who have questions or comments. And I'd love to actually, if we can, and if Commissioner Squirrel is going to be able to stay a little bit longer, at least see if there are questions that are that should be directed specifically to Commissioner Squ uh, Sherling uh, from Representative Christensen, Representative Durfee, and Representative Donahue. And recognizing we only have like five or six minutes until Commissioner Sherling may have to leave. I am we'll working we... an extension for you, sir. I'm going to try to get to, to uh, 1.30. Okay, we're, we're, we'll be pleased if you can do that. So, so let me turn first to Representative Christensen. Mine is a pretty short question. Um, I think the embedded program is a great one, but how many calls do embedded health workers go to in relation to the number of calls the police have? Basically, how busy, how busy are they? And is there a ballpark figure of their use? They are incredibly busy. Uh, in the the almost eight years I was chief in Burlington, our call volume, uh, where there was a mental health intersection, grew over 400 percent, and we were utilizing these workers. So the other way to look at this is the team grew from a single person to now two teams of roughly half a dozen each in the Chittenden County area, all based on demand. Um, so they're going to hundreds and hundreds of calls. In addition, uh, also of note, and this, your question is excellent because it brings up this uh, side note as well. In many instances, they're making proactive contact with folks that uh, may have had a call three or four days ago or may have had multiple calls in the last month. And they're doing sort of maintenance contact and ensuring that they have what they need and that they're healthy and safe and that they don't have to call 911 uh, for an emergent need, uh, and they're doing a lot of proactive work uh, in that regard when they're not responding to calls as well. Thank you. So I'm, I, I'm going to keep asking for members to at least put their questions on the table, and if along the way, Commissioner Squirrel, feel free to, and uh, Morning Fox, jump in. Uh, Representative Durfee and Representative Donahue. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and Commissioner Sherling, thank you. Uh, you had talked about the uh, barracks coverage areas. And I, I live right down the road from the Shaftesbury barracks. And uh, not too far in the other direction is the Bennington Police Department. And I'm wondering if, if, if this envisions someone embedded in Shaftesbury with the state police uh, and, and calls typically would come into the Bennington Police Department uh, how, how will that work in practice uh, if, if, if the intent here is um, to, to be performing interventions before there are crises? Are they going to be getting to know the, the folks that they're most likely to be dealing with when there is a crisis, I guess is, is what I'm thinking. And, and it would apply to other locations, I guess, around the state too. Yeah, the, uh, the underlying answer is uh, the practice will evolve once uh, there's some experience, but, uh, but generally um, 
the the overarching goal is that this is a statewide asset that we're suggesting investing in, not just an asset for the state police. So uh, covering Bennington to the greatest extent possible, uh, we see as uh, part of the mix. Um, but you've also hit on uh, where resources will get stretched, right? So Bennington's a, a reasonable sized city by Vermont standards. And um, the, the future of this program, if you go back to the beginning of, of my remarks, we hope is that by demonstrating the efficacy of deploying these, these first um, 10 uh, in the barracks is that we then have folks in healthcare, designated agencies and other stakeholders, municipalities, et cetera, willing to step up and co-invest to expand the program. Um, I can almost guarantee you that a single worker uh, in, in that barracks with Bennington close by is not going to be enough. That, yeah, that, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, and, and is it nine or is it 10 that are, the funding is envisioning for, for this year's budget? There's seven uh, funded positions in this budget. There are two positions that are already funded in Westminster and Shaftesbury, but um, also important to note, those positions are currently funded by the designated agencies. So we're very well aware that in order to bring parity statewide that uh, not only do we have one more barracks that needs coverage that isn't envisioned here, uh, but also that um, we've got um, two positions that are funded and using alternative strategies that uh, we've got to bring some parity to. Can, can I ask which one isn't uh, envisioned for the funding? Which we haven't exactly we haven't exactly figured that out. But if I were to, uh, I've been asked this a few times in the last few days. On the I'll fly, bet. my best guess is it's going to be Chittenden because there's such robust resources there already. Okay. And it's it's um, Bellows Falls and St. Albans is the second one, right? Currently, yes, yeah, okay. thank you. Okay, uh, Representative Donahue, uh, thank you. Yes, um, and and part of this may be uh, I'll put on the table for, for future discussion when we get more into it, but but part may be um, right up front now. I'm still grappling with our use of the term embedded and what that means in terms of specific models and specific um, programs being proposed because um, you know, we, we have a lot out there and we have a, a specific proposal here. And, and I'm really wondering in terms of sort of public perception, does embedded mean, I mean, who are they a part of? is really, I think, in the public mind. Are they part of the police structure and police roles providing mental health support? Are they part of the mental health system and a mental health role that's supporting what, what the police need to respond to? Because I think, I think there would probably be pretty broad consensus that working closely together um, matters and is probably the most important thing. But when we get down to, well, who do they report to? Who's, who's um, you know, reporting the reporting structure? Who, who owns them and all that um, gets into more of the specifics. And it, and it maybe leads to kind of an ultimate question of, you know, is part of the reason that we even need these and recognize the need for enhanced uh, support and response because of uh, the failure to adequately fund and staff um, the existing crisis teams who one would think that this, um, or th this has traditionally been their, part of their intended role. Um, I know I've been, I've been to Team 2 uh, programs and I've talked with police agencies who have said, well, the problem with Team 2 is they tell us how to collaborate, but when we call the crisis teams, they don't come because they don't have enough staffing and they're not available to respond. Um, so it's, it's in part a much broader uh, question about um, the resources, but in the more specific, what embedded means in terms of this model. Is this yeah. proposal is to say, this is part of the police structure and the police role um, versus it's part of the mental health structure and mental health response role? So great series of questions. I'll, I'll have to defer the crisis team investment component to Commissioner Squirrel because I don't know the statewide uh, overlay for that. Um, 
Are you are you clear to hear me, or are you hearing a lot of background noise right now? Okay, good. Um, the uh, I don't want to get bogged down by the word embedded. Uh, so if there's a suggestion for a better way to frame that, we're all ears. Um, the to answer the first part of your question, Representative, they're part of the overall uh, public safety fabric. Um, not only in law enforcement, but for uh, our ambulance services and rescue squads, uh, for our emergency departments where uh, they're often finding themselves responding. Um, so it, it's really embedded in many different things. But if there's a better way to describe that, that's great. Um, that said, one of the, the core goals is to deliver more surgical response than you would typically get uh, from a police officer responding uh, to a mental health or even a co-occurring disorder. Um, hold on just a second, it's about to get loud. There's a motorcycle next door. Um, we're in the parking lot, I suppose. Um, in, uh, I lost my train of thought. Um, the, the reality of, of uh, 911 in the 21st century is that um, you have access to really three things by calling 911. You can get the fire service, you can get an ambulance, or you can get a police car. Um, the scope of response for our partners in fire service and EMS is pretty limited. The scope of response for law enforcement and policing is enormous. It's, it's really a catch-all for absolutely everything else that doesn't fit neatly into the fire service or EMS. And adding uh, these additional tools to this toolbox in terms of what response you can get uh, is, is the purpose of the embedding. So, so just a brief follow-up is, but in this model, who are they, are they reporting to supervisor and supervisory structure within uh, the state police, the barracks they're in, or are they- no, I, I, Sorry, I missed your middle question there. I skipped yeah. it. Um, the, they would be employees of a designated agency. Their clinical oversight and uh, operational uh, supervision would come from the designated agency as it does in, in uh, the other programs. Um, but there's a memorandum of understanding that is in place that sort of outlines the types of work that they do in the arena of public safety. Um, so while uh, they're partnered with our supervisors and our folks that are responding, um, there's no direct supervisory uh, relationship there. Okay. Commissioner Squirrel, do you want to comment at all on the crisis, the, the, the advocacy of the crisis model? Within yeah, the absolutely. Generally? Absolutely. It's a great question, Representative Donahue, and I, I did try to allude to it um, earlier in my comments that, um, and I do think, you know, what's at the heart of this, I mean, this is not public safety proposing, they're going to hire their own clinicians under VSP, you know, they're trying to partner with the designated community mental health agencies, which I think is the right way to do it. There is that clinical oversight, there is that expertise, um, and then they're supporting law enforcement, um, you know, at the community level. I would also just add that, as I mentioned before, kind of midterm and longer term, you know, my vision and the vision that I think that we aspire to as a system of care is that we are able to successfully expand the continuum of prevention services and continue to expand crisis services um, so that that response can be more robust, it can be more proactive, we can intervene earlier, um, as I said earlier, you know, without law enforcement even needing to be involved at all. Um, however, the current system in terms of how, you know, what's the first door that individuals go to, unfortunately, sometimes in our current state, it's law enforcement. Um, so if we can enhance that first encounter for an individual who has, is struggling with a mental health issue, get them directly connected to the clinical and therapeutic services that they need, um, that's the right next step. But at the same time, I think we need to hold ourselves accountable as a system um, to be really looking at what is the expansion of emergency services that we need in the state and what is the expansion of peers as a part of that. Um, to me, is, is incredibly important um, as we look forward. And I, that is articulated in the 10-year plan um, that DMH um, has put forward as well. I want to say just for a 
Was, I'm sorry, someone else was speaking. Was that? Okay. Uh, I was just going to say that uh, from my years of working in the mental health system, but some years ago now, I acknowledge it, uh, but also I, that I find myself as I was thinking about this proposal, kind of touching on what uh, Commissioner Sherling was alluding to that uh, when, when people talk about calling the police, it's it's, um, I'm sorry, am I, I'm getting some feedback. Okay. Someone when, isn't muted. Someone yeah, else think, isn't muted. Yeah, I think Representative Cordes, you may need, but you said you're muted. Okay. Um, let me just say that, that I think many times people, when they see a difficult situation and where there's mental health issues involved, the first response is we need to call the police. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what Commissioner Sherling is alluding to, that the, that the police are the catch-all for most community members who are not necessarily knowledgeable at some high level of uh, what's the mental health system's role, what's the law enforcement role, what, who, who's, do we have diversion programs, do we have street workers, whatever. It's like there's something going on that's sufficiently disturbing to me as a citizen or as a someone someone call the police. And I think that that is, that is the, the frame in which I see this as um, trying to bring more resource to uh, that, to those crisis situations. Uh, they may be because, the, because likely law enforcement is gonna be called. Uh, and, and we want there to be additional resource that's not just coming from the law enforcement frame, as Commissioner Sherling has said. And so, uh, so there, this is living, it's, my observation anyway, is that this lives on the boundary between trying to provide crisis services around mental health and support to the law enforcement community who are becoming de facto the point of contact for many communities and many citizens within the community. And this is trying to add resource so that a more effective response can be provided to the citizen who's having the distress or the crisis. And, and I, I think Commissioner Sherling, I'll say that the reason I asked early on about what did embedded mean, I think, I think there is something about the word embedded that carries levels of connotation that, that go beyond what, uh, it, it, may, it may provide a level of comfort or, or not, not comfort, it, it may provide a level of acceptance uh, in the world that you're living in and for some others it it has connotations that maybe go toward the level of what Representative China was saying earlier that, that uh, well if, if they're embedded with the police well then they, aren't they just really part of the police and uh, so I think I think that's something to think further about to struggle with in term, terminology sometimes language sometimes makes a big difference in terms of uh, public messaging and acceptance uh, for for the various communities involved and impacted, so that's a great point. We will uh, we'll work to we'll alter that uh, over the next day or so as we're refining. Well, let's, let's, uh, and, I think, and I think you. and I and I think if it's possible for some people to be following some of our testimony, I think we, there may be some helpful thoughts that are offered that can help uh, help help us all resolve some of these questions that we have. So I don't see any other hands right now from, and I know we have other witnesses that we want to hear from. Uh, I want to say thank you. Uh, I think I'm going to suggest that we, we pivot now to our other witnesses. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Sherling. Uh, this has been very helpful. Uh, Commissioner Squirrel, likewise, thank you. And, and Commissioner, uh, Deputy Commissioner Fox. Uh, if either of you are able to stay and hear some of the other witnesses, I think that would be helpful as well. But if you're not, we understand. But I think at this point, I'd like uh, Coach Christie, I'd like to turn to you uh, and uh, maybe Ann, I'm going to ask Represent Representative Donahue perhaps to introduce uh, what we're about to be hearing more from uh, our next witnesses. So Representative Donahue, I'm going to turn it to you. Uh, thank, uh, thank you. Um, just very briefly, I've been a part of the, um, the Social Equity Caucus, which um, has been uh, pretty active along with um, the government operations and judiciary committees on looking at the question of um, police reforms, policing reforms, um, and so forth. And it, it became clear 
uh, it was already clear probably for those of us uh, deep in the, in the mental health world, but it became clear in terms of public responses that the um, Social Equity Caucus um, fielded a, a broad statewide survey, uh, Judiciary and GovOps had some public hearings. <clears throat> and the issue of um, mental health response was um, very active in, um, in, in many of the comments. And so uh, Coach Christie, as um, the, the chair of the Social Equity Caucus, um, I think can give a little intro to uh, what its aims were with this survey, um, which really had some, I think, fairly significant um, information of interest to what we're looking at in terms of uh, public perceptions about needs specific to, um, to mental health response within the scope of, um, of policing reform. And then um, Robin Joy is with the um, Crime Research Group here in Vermont. Uh, and has helped with the survey and can help present, will help present uh, what some of those findings were. So let's turn it over to uh, Representative Christie and uh, Robin Joy to, in whatever combination and order makes best sense, I think probably starting with Kevin Christie, Coach Christie. Hello everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome to you as well. Um, I, I'm really uh, honored to be able to be here uh, with you today, um, you know, to t give a quick uh, history of the the caucus itself, um, and it's very self-explanatory when you look at the name of the caucus and its mission. The Social Equity Caucus is an inclusive learning community. You know, that is very <laughs> uh, intentional. The, so the Social Equity Caucus is a group compromised of legislators and advocates working with a mission to improve outcomes for marginalized peoples and create a vehicle for Vermonters to access their representation, leadership, and community. It is not enough to get rid of institutionalized inequality. We aim to institutionalize equity and inclusivity. Now, you notice I was very emphatic, you know, about that description. And, you know, it's meant to be that way. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a radical approach um, of merging uh, Vermonters together to help us in our work, you know, and, and that's the key. And I'm really proud of all of the folks that have been working with us. Uh, I look around the room um, and, and I see folks that have been, you know, like part of uh, our community, you know, of uh, Vermonters trying to help other Vermonters get through these, especially these crazy times that we're in right now uh, uh, with the pandemic, especially. Um, so to get to our, our survey, um, we were trying to elicit more voice from Vermonters across the state. Uh, so a team uh, of, of us, uh, community members and legislators started looking at, you know, what would be a useful way to do that. Uh, as you could see, uh, there were three hearings that resulted from that uh, discussion. Uh, there were joint hearings with the Judiciary and House Government Operations Committee. And they weren't just regular hearings. They were intentionally offered at different times of the day so that we could get more access to people who normally couldn't participate, you know, in our work. So there was one done on a Sunday. There was one done in the evening. And then there was one done intentionally at the noon hour. So we were looking at how do we access the voices of Vermonters who normally aren't, aren't accessed. So th that was the hearings. 
in an obviously more formalized because they were directly related to our legislative hat. So then we branched out to say, OK, let's take off that hat and see how can we access Vermonters who normally wouldn't even find themselves comfortable coming to the legislature in any way. So a group of folks um, uh, working with uh, our lead on this, Sarah Coffey and uh, Lucy Rogers, uh, developed a survey instrument. Uh, a fairly simple one, but it was designed to ask Vermonters, what do you think with regard to this redesign uh, of law enforcement? And how does it affect you as an individual Vermonter? Um, I'll give, I was really pleased with our responses. We had 1,446 responses. Every single county in the state responded. You know, some more than others. Um, you know, women, men, people of uh, varied um, uh, backgrounds, um, uh, the disabled community. Um, it, it, um, it, it, it achieved what we were hoping it would. Um, we're still learning from it because, you know, with that many responses, obviously getting to um, what was said by our fellow Vermonters is really important. Uh, so during one of our, our meetings, the uh, crime research group, uh, offered uh, their expertise in analyzing data uh, over and above what we shared with you, uh, which is the uh, uh, the baseline uh, survey monkey uh, analysis. Uh, there's three files that I shared with all of it, all of the members, and and I just recently did it, so it's at the top of your uh, email. <laughs> because we know how that works. You know, I mean, if we, if we send it yesterday, it's buried. It's buried. You know? <laughs> uh, but but recently did it intentionally to so that it, you'd be able to see it fairly quickly. Um, so one of the pieces, uh, the link that's in the email will actually allow you to access uh, question six of the survey, which asked the question, do you have any additional comments? We had somewhere in the neighborhood of over 600 people who responded to, oh yeah, I've got something extra to say. <laughs> uh, so, and that's where the meat and potatoes is of, uh, you know, the survey as well. Um, and, you know, we're still, analyzing that. And I think at this point, I'd like to um, uh, ask if uh, Dr. Uh, Attorney Robin Joy would um, uh, uh, chime in as far as her look at uh, that part of the responses. And, sure. and she's, she's developed a tool to help us analyze that as well. So uh, Dr. Joy. Thank you. Uh, so for the record, uh, this is Robin Joy. I am the Director of Research for Crime Research Group. Um, just a little background since I don't normally appear in front of this committee. Um, we used to be the Vermont Center for Justice Research, and uh, we have a contract to provide state statistical analysis services um, for the state on crime and criminal justice policy issues. For example, some of the things that you can just ask me for or any of the public can ask me for is, what do people who get charged with this crime get sentenced to? Or what do the arrest rates look in my ta look like in my town? And all sorts of things. Um, and then we also apply for grants that help support um, research into policy issues that our stakeholders have an interest in. For this uh, project, what we did uh, is we did volunteer our time to help uh, the committee analyze all of the responses um, and the qualitative aspect of it. Um, overall, I just want to point out that out of the people that responded to the survey, um, increasing access to mental health uh, services 
no matter what that looked like, just the general let's increase access was the highest of all the um, options. So people could rank the, the questions one to five. Um, you could choose multiple number fives, which were the most important. And um, But uh, increasing um, funding for mental health outreach um, overall scored the highest out of any of the options that people had. And in a close second um, came um, adding more social workers to uh, law enforcement. And then what we did um, is we, we kind of, um, I'm sorry, uh, three things haven't happened in the time that you guys have been meeting. No one's mowed their lawn, my dog didn't bark, and the train didn't go by. Um, and now all those things have happened, so I'm trying to find a room where my dog won't hear you. Um, or you won't hear my dog. Uh, so um, the, uh, the 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 uh, responses. So what we did is um, we looked through all the responses and assigned just kind of a general term to them um, that was the gist of what the person was saying. So it didn't necessarily mean whether they were pro or against, but really this comment was about mental health or really this comment was about citizen oversight or really this comment um, was about uh, the ACLU 10-point plan or those sorts of things. Um, when it came to mental health, mental health showed up in a few different places and with a few different um, themes attached to them. So one theme attached to mental health was this idea of training for officers around mental health issues. Um, I, I can't speak to what training officers currently get, but there was a strong uh, presence of people in the survey responses who really wanted to make sure that law enforcement were getting training um, around cultural competency with mental health issues, um, around a different um, particular uh, mental or behavioral health issues. Um, one, one person um, specifically requested training on autism and autistic responses to um, situations. Another person specifically um, was looking at issues of PTSD and how, you know, how can we uh, increase officers' understanding of how people with PTSD respond. Another group of answers was very concerned with um, this idea of embedding uh, police officers. And there was a lot of confusion in the responses on how that would happen. And then there was also a sense in the answers of defund the police means defund the police, and this is not defunding the police. Uh, so um, that, that's, I'm just reporting what some of the answers were. Um, overall, though, I would say that the concern of how uh, our society responds to mental health, as the commissioner, uh, uh, Shirley, was saying, like, you know, with this hammer, the criminal justice system, um, that from the responses is unacceptable to the people who responded. So I'll just kind of stop there for now and see if there's any questions or if uh, Coach or Representative Donahue want to prompt me for something that I have not said that I said before. Uh, let me let me see if Coach or Representative Donahue wish to weigh in or ask question or comment first, and otherwise I'm going to turn to questions from the committee. Coach, I think that was a great overview. I think that was a great overview, and I think questions might you know draw out other aspects. Okay. Thank okay. you. Uh, Representative Houghton, do you have a question or a comment? And I apologize, I have a question. A large vehicle went by my house with your very last statement and I could not that hear was... <laughs> what you said. I apologize. Um, well, I think I was just asking uh, to, because I had spoken with Rep Donahue and uh, Representative Christie before that um, if there was anything that I had forgotten. No, no right the before that, comment. a comment about oh. something about a nail in a head maybe? I... About the embedding. The, the yeah. Oh, connection, yes. So, connection to police social work versus exterior. Yes. Um, and so the, um, there, there, was, there was a contingent of people who responded. So everybody wants somebody, the people who responded overwhelmingly, whether they left a comment or not, are concerned about the way our criminal justice system interacts with our mental health system, or at least concerned about the way the people who experience mental health issues 
are interacting with our criminal justice system. I think that's a better way for me to phrase it. Um, there are people who are concerned about the idea of embedding police officers or embedding uh, mental health officers in a police department because their argument is that they want to defund the police and this is not defunding the police. Um, but I will say that overwhelmingly people are uh, asking for in this survey something to be done about mental health. Um, and then they have varying um, subgroups of how best to ap approach that. Great. Thank you so much for repeating that. I sure. apologize. Don't worry about it. Yeah, that was helpful to hear again. Yeah. You, you uh, know, and I think, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, in listening to the earlier testimony, I, I think that question of language and then definition becomes very critical. Uh, and Representative Donahue brought that out in her, you know, in a number of different statements. And I think we heard that uh, from uh, both uh, uh, Commissioner and Deputy Commissioner and Commissioner Sherling as well, uh, that people's understanding, you know, language is po a powerful tool. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it I, I think as simple as we might say, well, geez, people ought to, no, no, don't even go there. <laughs> uh, uh, as a teacher, and I, I think most of us have taught, you know, at some level or trained at some level, you know, we understand, you know, when you're trying to help somebody understand something, that's the most difficult job or task that anybody ever embarks on. So it really becomes critical how we go about doing that. And, and I think um, it would be incumbent upon us to be very uh, uh, reflective of how we address this one based on the information. I mean, the data speaks, you know, for itself. Um, Dr. Joy just shared with us, you know, the results of this the voices of our constituents basically saying, we need this fixed. And they understand that there's the need. So they're leaving it up to us to answer that, that question, so. And, and if I, can I, can I just say that I think, uh, I, I wanna just reflect that I appreciate uh, the Speaker of the House giving us the direction because uh, our committee's response was the proposal has uh, that's coming forward. Uh, we're concerned about mental health access for Vermonters and mental health issues and law enforcement, uh, but we have not had the chance to analyze the proposal or hear testimony, take testimony, nor hear voices of the impacted communities. And so that's what we're in the midst of right now. And so I think it's very important and I, and I, uh, I just publicly give credit to uh, Speaker Johnson for saying, okay, uh, this is an opportunity. This may, be a, this may be exactly how we should move forward, but I'm going to uh, charge our committee that's uh, whose primary responsibility or who has primary responsibility around mental health, working closely with the Judiciary Committee and the Government Operations Committees who have been listening to communities around police reform uh, to have us analyze this, take testimony, which we're doing today and we'll, we'll do again next week uh, before we make any further recommendation. And and, uh, and, then, and then responding, as you said, Coach Christie, uh, you know, being trying to be as thoughtful as we can in terms of hearing the results of the survey as well as uh, testimony that we hear. Uh, back to uh, the point of um, um, Madam Speaker. Um, oh, seven weeks ago, um, uh, a group of uh, legislators um, and uh, community members and of the affected community um, met with uh, Speaker Johnson. And I think that that in that discussion uh, helped uh, inform her uh, and it had such a positive effect that that's how we got to uh, this, uh, um, she had actually invited uh, the psychiatric survivor community um, 
uh, the BIPOC community together, you know, in a in a small group session. And uh, like you said, to her credit, um, that's what helped us continue this work uh, moving forward. Uh, just another quick uh, comment, if I may. The Social Equity Caucus um, will also be working over the next uh, few months. Uh, we were able to put together a task force uh, and it's a task force made up of uh, not your normal cast of characters, so to speak. Uh, usually when we put a task force together, it's commissioner this, it's deputy commissioner that, you know, and, and then a, a sprinkling of affected people. We flipped that paradigm. It's all affected people and a smack or uh, a sprinkling of legislators. So it's a 14 member task force uh, and there will be five legislators uh, involved but only in a hearing capacity uh, in that in that task force. Um, right now it's being formulated and some of the topics that we're talking about now will be ongoing for the next legislative session so that we will be able to continue uh, that work. Uh, and it was supported through the Vermont Community Foundation. So there will be a honorarium paid directly to those participants, those 14 uh, member Vermonters who will be work doing that work. Uh, so it, it, it's, a, it's an exciting approach to our work in general, but I just wanted to share that with the committee as well. Okay. So other questions for uh, Representative Christie or Dr. Joy about the results of the survey. So I'm not seeing any other hands right now. Uh, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, this is very helpful uh, for us to understand. And, and I've asked um, our committee assistant, Dennis Martin, to post the documents that you provided, uh, Coach. They'll be posted on our House Healthcare Committee page today so that it's easily accessed by people who may be listening on YouTube. Uh, and would not have received your email. But those do documents from the survey responses and the analysis are posted on our House Healthcare Committee page as well, our web page. Good to see everybody Great. virtually. <laughs> Good. Thank you. you know, I, I missed you guys in the hall, you know, I mean, geez. Uh, well, we all do. We all yeah. do. It's, it's, it's a frustration that, and it's, it's the, it's to be quite honest, it's that human contact, which we have sometimes in between the official work that we do, as well as official contact in the halls. Uh, people have no idea how much work gets done in the hallways and the cafeteria, uh, but we don't have a virtual cafeteria right now. Yeah, and, really, really. And we're not we in the hall. got to figure that one out. <laughs> right, right. How um, you doing, Brian? <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah, okay, there he is. All right. That, that's, yeah, that, that's Brian. Okay. We got several brains going on here. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to suggest that uh, at this point, maybe we, uh, I'm going to turn to Representative Donahue as well, and maybe um, I'm going to reserve major committee discussion for later uh, after we've heard some further witnesses. Uh, but I would anticipate, I would encourage folks to um, look over the documents that Commissioner Sherling provided, to look over the documents that Coach Christie's provided. Uh, the there's information from um, care Vermont care partners kind of summarizing some of what was reviewed today in terms of what's the current relationship between the designated agencies and um, mental health assistance to law enforcement in different models. Um, I think our, our, our hope is that in the next several hearings in the next well not hearings but this next several meetings of our committee we'll both hear from some invited stakeholder groups, um, as well as hear some about different models that exist around how, how you know, and we talk about best practices, but I'm not sure if there's any 
science to which are the which of the practices are the best, but whether we know there are different practices having different uh, different models, uh, and hear that so that we can inform our discussion as a committee in terms of making a recommendation uh, to the House Appropriations Committee as it uh, moves forward in its uh, negotiations and dialogue with the Senate uh, around the budget. In the meantime, as I said, uh, we have posted on our website uh, the language, and I think I sent it, Demis sent it out to all committee members last night, the placeholder language uh, about the Department of Public Safety proposal. Uh, uh, I'm not certain, but it may perhaps be modified some ways by the Appropriations Committee, but uh, we'll know about that shortly because they'll be presenting their full budget to us shortly. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn to Representative Donahue and ask you if you have any further thoughts to help us frame these issues as we move forward. And then uh, we can bring this to a close uh, if there's, there's nothing more for us to take on today. Um, my thought is, is I would encourage um, folks, maybe even commenting briefly now, if you have anything in mind, but, but based on what we've heard, who you think we need to hear from um, I think the Vermont CARES Partners documents really helpful. It, it identifies, you know, uh, where people are doing things. And I think uh, we're limited by time, but I'm, I'm, I think for sure we're gonna wanna hear from some of those, as the chair said, different, um, different models. Um, and we have, you know, the, the stakeholder groups that we know uh, we wanna hear from people directly involved. Um, so they, they're obvious, but if there are other people that um, members can think of now or, you know, to drop, drop an email to the chair um, that, that you think would be important to hear from um, next Tuesday or Wednesday, it would be and great. Please, please, if you drop me a note, copy it to uh, Representative Donahue as well. And, and Representative Hoden. And Representative Hoden. The triune. <laughs> Well, Representative Donahue is, is helping to take the lead on uh, organizing some of this. So just to acknowledge that. Any, any comments or thoughts before we adjourn for the day? Okay. Well, again, I want to I want to thank uh, those who participate today. Uh, Commissioner Squirrel, uh, Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox, uh, Commissioner Sherling, uh, Coach. Um, and I have to say, it took me some getting used to to call you coach uh, when, I, when we first started serving together, but uh, uh, Representative Christie uh, and uh, Dr. Joy, thank you all. Oh, I'm sorry, Brian Smith, I see, I see a hand. I didn't see it before. And, I, and then it was yeah, there. I, so just, I, I, I just put it on, uh, Chair. Uh, I just want to say, mm -hmm. hi, coach. It is good to see you, but it's more fun sitting across the desk from you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is Coach still and, there? Oh yeah. Yeah, he. Oh yeah, he's there. He's there. He's there. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> you bet. Okay. Uh, with that, I'm going to suggest look, look, that we look, you got another oh, new hand. I didn't. I'm missing it. Let me. Uh, who, who is oh, it? I'm sorry. I don't see them. No, it went. It either went down again, or or I saw it run. Never mind. Yeah, I think we caught it. Okay. So uh, thank you all. I think uh, Demis, you can take us off YouTube and a reminder for the committee, we have we will be meeting at 3.30 on Tuesday. Uh, and Demis, maybe can you chime in and remind us of the times for Wednesday and Thursday since I... Yes, I will. I'm gonna stop live streaming right now. Okay. That's fine, that's fine. 